first of all, enormous apologies that we are late. I'm afraid a satellite over London went kapum, kapow, blew up, exploded and disappeared. Uh, Alex Voss built another one out of his iPhone and sent it up into the atmosphere and now we are back live. Sorry about that. If you've stumbled across this website, you are with Wild Earth TV and this is a very live safari. Um, Brian is on camera, my name is James Henry, hurtling up behind us at 100 miles an hour is Brent Leo Smith and the inimitable Andrew Freddie Mercury Francis. Uh, there is a giraffe there obviously that you were looking at when we started. You are on a live safari, hashtag safari live. If you want to talk to us, comment on anything that you would like to, uh, well within reason of course, and questions at wildearth.tv if you would like to email us. Now, that of course is a giraffe, it has disappeared. We are heading up towards a lion pride that was last seen uh, just north of us. We saw it this morning. Brent found it again this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to consult with him quickly. Uh, he certainly has dibs on it, but I'm not sure he's going to get any signal there. I was coming to the giraffe when I saw right. that I see. Okay, but I don't think Brent's going to get any signal there. He is on the Wendy, and we're a little bit uh, techno, um, shall we say, techno poor today. So we're going to head to the lions. Brent is going to drive around here in a small circle, and <laughs> we'll join him a little bit later. Okay, here we go. Sorry once again for our lickness. Um, in the final control, in case you are concerned, and you should be, is Tara Dales on the second director's chair, and in the first director's chair, Louise Pavard recently arrived from Johannesburg. Here we go. Eugene is, of course, is running about trying to fix bits and pieces of what's going on, but uh, we'll see what happens now. So those lions this morning, in case you, have, you didn't join us, those lions killed two more buffalo calves last night. So that brings to the total to about 13 buffalo killed in the last eight days. That is a substantial hit to the buffalo population and certainly a bit of a boon to the lion population which have been feeding uh, thoroughly over the last little while. And in case you've missed the last few days, what is interesting is that there are three lion prides around this area in the heart of the Nkuhuma Pride Territory. Uh, none of those prides, not one of them, is the actual Nkuhuma Pride whose territory this is. So we think that they are probably off in the Kruger National Park. We're not sure why they're in the Kruger National Park. Probably something to do with the Birmingham males. Um, possibly trying to, uh, who knows, possibly there's some food there. But I think also the other reason that the other lions are here is that the water is now very concentrated. We've had a bit of a rainy day, uh, not hugely productive from a rain point of view, lots of lightning. In fact, Brian and I were nearly struck just before we were supposed to go live at four o'clock. Uh, we said some bad words and then ran for cover. But, so there isn't a lot of water around and that that there is is concentrated in these dams and so the buffalo are moving in a very predictable fashion and what that means is that they're pretty easy to kill for lions that have no how to kill them. Anyway, that's the general idea of what's going on with the lions. Once again, big apology that we are late today. Uh, nothing we can do I'm afraid, I'm not sure what happened to the satellite. Uh, but we are making our way to the lions and we'll see what we can find from that end. Please remember, talk to us. We do love to hear from you, especially if you're a new viewer. And we've had a, lots of interaction with a few new viewers in the last few days. And uh, that's not to say we don't want to hear from our regulars. But very good to hear from some newer viewers as well. Tell us where, what your name is and where you're from and we'll answer your questions. If they are um, answerable, of course. As you can see, the weather is probably, I would put it at about 16 degrees Celsius, 61 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a bit blustery, there's wind blowing from all directions, there's thunder around the place, and there's certainly a, um, a feeling that we might be dumped upon by these clouds at any stage. But, this is kind of early summer frontal weather, and it often doesn't bring rain. Um, Diane, 
weather in New England, a nice question about rain and how it will fill the dams and how, uh, you know how long it will take and what the pattern is. Diane, finding a pattern for any kind of African rainfall unless you're sitting directly over the equator is very difficult. So here it's very irregular. But generally the big rain uh, comes with storms that come out of the northwest or the northeast, either from a cyclone that comes off Mozambique or uh, from a storm that comes off the mountains. This sort of weather often just produces soft soaking rain, uh, but it's difficult to predict what's going to happen when. Most of the big rain, the most of the volume of rain that we get will come come in over the mountains or that come in off cyclone systems that uh, hit the coast of Mozambique. Um, how long it will take for Gauri Dam to get full is very difficult to say. I suspect, um, I mean we had 36 mils earlier this year and it certainly made a huge difference. It went from completely dry to a pretty good sized pad. So I think once we've had 100 millimeters of rain or so, or, um, 150 which is about uh, six inches of rain you'll find that that waterhole dam is, is almost half full. Now we're going through a slightly dodgy signal area here if you do lose us please be patient it's not because the second satellite has exploded um, we will be back with you as soon as we hit the cut line so I'm not going to talk too much as I go through this particular area. In fact, Brent Leo Smith's picture has just come up, so let's nip across to him while I drive through this dodgy area. Uh, let's see what he has to tell you, and he'll give you an update on where he is, and I'll see you hopefully with the lions. Welcome! Uh, my name is Brent Leo Smith, and I have Andrew Francis on camera with me today. And while James races off to the kitty cat, uh, due to our limited <laughs> range, uh, I managed to find quite a nice group of giraffes here. There's about six of them spread out through the bush. And you are very welcome on a live African safari. And you are seeing these giraffes at the exact same time as me, and very hopefully we'll be seeing some lions at the exact same time as James very shortly. That giraffe seems to be very interested in what I'm saying, but still not going to let go of that buffalo thorn that it's feeding on. That's a female giraffe, and without saying the obvious bits, you can tell that by her head. You can see she's got quite small horns, and they're quite hairy. Uh, a male would have a far more robust set, and also some scar tissue and bumps up on his forehead from fighting. Also possibly quite a lot taller than her. Enjoying the nice fresh shoots on that buffalo thorn. And you can just see under her neck there's another giraffe. You just pick a tiny bit of movement underneath. There we go, Andrew's focusing in. There's another giraffe there. Oh, there's the head pop up. And that looks like a young male. And you can see already the top of the horns does not have any hair on it. Quite often considered to be silent, but they are not. They do have various grunts and snorts uh, that they do make from time to time. But on average, a very, very silent animal compared to the rest of the animals out here in the African bush. Let's have a look if we can see some of the other giraffe around there. I was hoping when we were rushing back from the rain a little bit earlier, there was quite a young baby 
with them. And I was hoping that that baby was going to be visible here. And with this, an apex predator in this wind. Gusting around so it makes and He's also on the move now. And there's some zebra through the bushes as well, in between those two buffalo, or the buffalo thorn and the knob thorn there, Andrew. Straight through that gap. Oh, disappearing. Males, their foreheads will be really, really battle scarred, and they'll have quite a big... So you can see there's already quite a lump developing there, and that's scar tissue from fighting. And they will get quite a serious build-up. And if you look behind them, you can see ominent, very ominous, sorry, weather behind. Lots of rain around. Unfortunately, it's not upon us just yet, but there was some incredible lightning earlier. One of the bolts struck very close. Uh, to quarantine clearings. What have you spotted, giraffe? Obviously, being high, they aren't Needle our way between the trees. They live out in the bush and loud noises from a very young age and take it as part of parcel of life. I've never seen them react negatively to thunder before. And so guys, I'm gonna go through these trees in front of us here. And I know a lot of you worry that we might damage the bush. We're very particular about which trees we drive over and also how we drive over trees. So we straddle them with the middle of the vehicle and a lot of the tree species here will just pop up. And just remember, almost all of these trees get fed on by elephants regularly and they'll carry on growing even after they've been broken by elephants. So us just moving over them quickly uh, doesn't really do any harm to them and we avoid all very slow growing trees so like timburji trees or african ebony's uh, things like that uh, but fast growing trees like acacias and terminalias which are in front of us pose us no problem Carry on and see what else we can find. Wonder if this cool weather is going to move all the elephants we've had around us recently. I hope not. I've really enjoyed having so many elephants on the property for the last while. On the 
subject to elephants. Uh, Blair, who's in British Columbia in the Great White North, was wondering, she said she saw an elephant standing on top of a termite mound. It must have been with James this morning on the sunrise safari. And she's wondering, and she said she's heard there could be like cement. And if it can hold the six ton elephant, how do animals like art fox, or ant bears, hyenas, war dogs, etc., dig into those termite mounds? So, well, they're very, very, um, uh, well, the one who actually does all the digging is the art fox. The others just excavate afterwards. They've got incredibly specialized, huge frontal claws that enable them to dig through that hard stuff and break up that substrate. So are we described them as, but we've got the two females here feeding on what remains of an expired buffalo that they killed last night. The rest of the pride is dotted about the place. Uh, one male lying in a position unbefitting the king of the jungle, just uh, to the right hand side of your screen. We can't show him to you because there's a vehicle looking at him. And then the others uh, off to the left of your screen, uh, some of them heading towards the water, if you see, and others just lying fat. There we go. That looks to be the, a male, as you can see behind the tail. Uh, a couple of bits and pieces that aren't there in the females. And there's another female just behind there. There's a bush in the way. You won't be able to see her. You might just catch a glimpse of her as Brian zooms out on the right-hand side of the screen. She is there. You can see a little bit of slightly discolored soil. There we go. Brian's got her. That's her. Over there. Okay, so that's the six of them. Three young males. Three females. And the most, the oldest one, the most mature, and not the dominant one. We had lots of questions this morning about dominance in lion prides. And remember that there's no real dominance hierarchy. It's based purely on size. That female, I think, is the oldest in the pride. And quite nice, quite interesting, her mother uh, also had a tail missing which of course is quite odd. They both have succumbed, possibly to hyenas biting them off, possibly to ticks getting in there and biting them off. Uh, it's difficult to say how. But this is um, a pride called Salala Pride, and for those of you who haven't been watching, the core of their territory is in fact way south of here, mostly around a far called Marthley, which is part of the world-famous Londolozi Game Reserve. And that's normally where they hang out, so why they're this far north, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, I suspect that it is the movement of buffalo that has moved them up here, and also the absence of the owners of this territory, the Inkahuma Pride, who have absconded into the Kruger National Park to the east of us. Quite a sight, that. The rustling around you can hear, of course, is my rain jacket, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but not much I can do. If the deluge does begin, um, I will need to be covered up. What can do to have me getting wet? Oh, wonderful, Andrew. That's a great picture. I'm Brian. Well done. And then just to reiterate for Ashley in North Carolina, thank you for your question. Um, you want to know why it is that the three prides that are around here now have not been chased out of the Inkahuma Pride's territory. And the simple fact of the matter is that the Inkahuma Pride is simply not here to chase them out. They've run into the Kruger. We don't know why. I think it's probably got quite a lot to do with the Birmingham boys, five young male lions who've recently come into the area. 
created a huge amount of upheaval. They've killed three of the Unkuhuma lionesses, and that kind of uh, uh, sort of distress that has been inflicted upon the Nkuhuma pride has made them very skittish. They probably aren't roaring, they probably aren't marking their territory like they would normally and that means of course that means of course that the that other lions will sort of see this as a, a, a vacuum, an empty territory that they can come and live in. And you can see that she's a very very big lioness that she's got very powerful back legs and I think probably they they look even more powerful because of her stubby little tail. She looks a little bit like a, a, a Doberman from behind, a pretty big Doberman. They are very full these lions, they've been eating buffalo for the last week or so. They killed with the Birmingham boys, they killed six buffalo in one night about a week ago and so they're not probably very hungry but as we had lots of discussion this morning the lions will not necessarily uh, eat only when they're hungry they will certainly eat you know as much as they can as often as they can and if you were to find if they were to have meat in this area for the next two or three weeks i think what you'd find is that they stayed put. They don't necessarily choose to do a huge amount of exercise, a bit like your house cat who um, is very content to eat and sleep all day long. Uh, house cats are teenagers, very similar sorts of uh, behavioral patterns. And just to give you a kind of sense of the sounds and smells uh, that we're having here, um, nice feeling of a cool breeze on our backs. every so often interspersed with an acidic jolt from the lion dung that has been deposited around here. Uh, certainly made me substantially balder this morning. Uh, Brian uh, has not yet to recover. His lips are still green from the, from the inhalation of gas produced by the lions. Now I have to tell you, if you don't know about it and you have never smelt it, nothing in the world smells like lion dung after 10 buffalo kill. Pretty formidable prey, our buffalo. An interesting comment from Barb G, and it's a good one. You say they arrived a few weeks ago looking stressed and injured, and they seem to have recovered, and they're a lot more, you say they're pretty adaptable. They are indeed very adaptable. They also will um, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, if you like. I'm not sure if that's a correct use of Shakespearean English, but what it means in this particular context, I'm not sure. If uh, this is how Hamlet meant it, but um, what it means is that when times are good, they're going to make hay while the sun shines. I'm mixing metaphors horribly here, but that's basically, basically, if there is food to eat, they will eat it because they will go through those tough times. Uh, so a little while back, they were injured, they were hungry, they had nothing to eat. They were probably on the run, possibly from the Birmingham boys, possibly from those matimbas who've been thrown out of this area by the Birmingham boys. Um, and they came up here, and now suddenly they've got so much to eat, they're not going to turn that opportunity down, they're going to eat themselves into a stupor for as long as they can. Because there's no question, at some stage, they will come, across, come upon hard times again looking to see where that vehicle is going in case we're in the way, which we are not. So let's just, we'll just drive a little bit around the corner here and have a look-see at these other two. And we can, we can put a light on them, they're adult lionesses. Right, an interesting question from Sandy in Palm City. Thank you, Sandy. Sandy, there are two aspects to your question that we must address. First of all, you want to know who is the male coalition that used to protect this pride. Um, a big key thing of what you've asked
asked there is that male coalitions do not necessarily offer protection. What they offer is a little bit in the way of security, but they certainly don't defend the pride against other marauding males. So if males do come into an area, um, if they are in, so if they're in a male's territory, um, to say that they protect them uh, implies that they have some kind of connection with the pride that will, they, they kind of dominate them more than protect them. So I think that's the key thing to know. Then the pride, the, the males further back where they were are the Majingalan. And the Majingalan coalition was five, it is still five, but they split into two and three. And they spread themselves very, very thin. I mean, they dominate a massive, massive area, much bigger than the Matimbas were, were dominating, and certainly much bigger than the Birminghams are dominating at the moment. What that means is that if other big males move into the area, they're going to struggle to maintain control over the whole territory all the time. So they've come from Majingalan territory, I think that they probably had a bit of conflict with the, the two Matimba males, who are very, very big males. And they went south uh, at the site of the first sort of warning of those Birmingham boys. They scarped off to the south, and I think they've caused some ructions there. That may well be why they initially came north, found the place unoccupied, and so they've just hung about. Oh, the smell has been changed. We've run over some ossimum species or wild anisine and that has very nicely and naturally freshened the air about us. Whew, what, a, what a relief. Very, very nice to have Miriam from KwaZulu Natal with us. Uh, Miriam, you want to know, do lions, if they kill each other, eat each other? Miriam, cannibalism in lions is well known and well documented, so absolutely they will. Uh, they will eat each other. They don't always eat each other, but certainly sometimes they will. Uh, some, and I've seen, um, I've seen three brothers eating um, a fourth member of their sort of brotherhood, uh, which was fairly disturbing to see. And certainly sometimes the males that kill cubs will eat the cubs. Sometimes mothers eat their cubs uh, if they're dead, if, you know, if they die of causes, uh, other than, say, infanticide. And then all the predators will eat each other just about. So hyenas will eat lions if they kill them. They'll certainly eat leopard if they kill them, and leopard will eat jackal, they'll eat um, wild dogs if they can catch them. So yep, yeah, there's, there's no real honor amongst thieves as it were. The one thing that isn't often done is that lions don't often eat hyenas. They'll often kill them, but they don't often eat them. And I think that's probably because of what hyenas eat. I suspect they taste pretty disgusting. I suspect, suspect likewise a lion will taste pretty foul. They, um, they are huge scavengers as well as being hunters. A, um, not a fact that was very um, accurately portrayed, for example, in The Lion King. And you can see the others. I'll just put a light on the others quickly. There are the rest of the pride down there. The bright orange glow. That's two more of them. And there was another one there that's going down to have a drink. Another brilliant question, and I must say I'm constantly astonished by the number and quality of great questions that we do get. Um, Doug in Connecticut, you want to know, surely the Birmingham boys, if they came into contact with the Salala Pride, would um, adversely affect the three young males here. They'd probably chase them out or kill them or something like that. Um, Doug, these three young males are are so innocuous at the moment, they're all they're hardly the size of their mothers yet. Um, and so no the Burm they'd, they'd be seen as part of the pride. They're almost all you know, they're sub adults.
in a little while though when they get a bit bigger and their testosterone levels start to rise and they start being a bit more like male lions then absolutely they'll be thrown out they'll be definitely chased away by the Birmingham boys so there's one of them there and you can see that his mane is very scraggly it is a well it's like that kind of wispy teenage mane young boys get a very unattractive time of life certainly was for me um, and I think the lions are very much the prey before it dies and so they might get kicked and that's very common you'll find lions always have got unless they live in captivity have got scars across the top of their faces and that's normally from feeding frenzies almost five years old probably they uh, still put on a bit of weight um, but those little feet they were well, they're little of course they're much bigger than your house cats but they're the same size as lionesses at the moment there's a fat belly So a very interesting one for, again from Susie, thank you Susie, um, you want to know how on earth did they kill the calf when, or did they fight off the rest of the herd, because you've obviously seen this before, and what happens is when lions are, are killing buffalo, the buffalo will often turn round and attack the lions, especially if they're going for a calf or something like that. Now. What you'll find, probably Susie, is that they will stampede the herd, and I think as Paul was probably alluding to, they'll stampede the herd, they'll grab a calf, if the calf bellows and makes a noise, the herd will often turn around. What they'll try and do is kill the calf or injure it sufficiently so that they can back off and it won't run away with the rest of the herd. So they'll grab it, try and injure it, either kill it outright or injure it enough so that when the herd turns they can back off and then they can re sort of join their kill or finish the job once the herd has given up on them so I suspect that's what happened here of course much more difficult for the buffalo to see what's going on at night they will turn and attack the lions if they can but again in the confusion of a chase through thick bush like this the lions grab a buffalo calf and grab it around the muzzle and the and the throat it won't utter a sound and I don't think the buffalo would notice, you know, they wouldn't know where to go and look uh, for the missing calf and they'd be so panicked and stampeding that yeah, I'm not sure even the mother would notice whether the calf was there or not until it was much too late. Very good question, thank you Susie. Uh, this is of course what lions do most of the time, lie down and do nothing, but I think we'll spend a bit more time with him simply because as the night falls, uh, Brent has certainly predicted that we may well get some hyena activity here and I think that that's probably quite a good prediction. The hyenas may well come around and see if they can't steal something to eat. And even though these lions are very full of meat, uh, you'll find that they will defend their carcass should the hyenas try and come through. We did see one this morning. They looked like a fairly large female came through. She kind of stuck around the place. And the lions didn't react at all. One of them kind of looked at her but didn't, didn't worry too much. It was only one of her. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if they don't come around again now. I saw one just now. Did you? Scuttling along the oh, Okay. Road. So Brian has already spotted one that was scuttling through the bushes there, he says. And yeah, she, they'll be very careful. They'll, they'll probably start calling they want to attract the others. Here you can hear some hippos. <laughs> Otherwise all is pretty quiet here. I think let's go back to the carcass. There certainly seem to be the sound of crunching bones and meat being eaten or rendered from the flesh being rendered from the carcass. Let's go and have a look there. And then a very nice 
nice question from Paul on Twitter, who's paying attention, clearly. And Hayden, when he was here for Nat Geo so Wild, uh, after our sort of live TV broadcast, made mention of the fact that there's a coalition of nine males nearby called the Skybed Males. Um, and Paul, you want to know, have I heard anything further about them? Uh, Paul, I haven't, but I do know that they're around. I haven't heard of them for a couple of months now. Um, and I don't, I think to say that they were heading south would be difficult uh, to, you know, I'm not sure that they're necessarily heading south as we speak, but they are in the north, in the Mandaleti, and so they could go north, but they, they may well come this way. It will depend very much on what the line dynamics are. I think, I've seen a picture of them, I think they're about two and a half years old, so they're not, um, they're not very big yet, but a coalition of nine male lions will create a major problem here. Um, certainly, they'll they'll tear the place apart if they come in here as four and a half or five year old males like those Birminghams. They'll definitely split up eventually, um, in probably into groups of two and three, maybe maybe up to four, depending on the area and depending on the concentration of other male lions. Uh, but <laughs> nine male lions would be a, a really formidable force. This female, despite the fact that she's extremely full, is continuing to uh, fill herself with buffalo meat. And just a few drops of rain starting to fall. Nothing major though. And mercifully, no more lightning. See if you can hear her chewing. What she's doing there is not in fact chewing. She's got very uh, specially adapted molars. So if you run your tongue around your teeth, around the molars and the molars of the back teeth, yours are very flat. Unless you're very odd, uh, you have got flat molars at the back. Now she, if you've got a house cat or a dog nearby, grab it, uh, put it on your lap and open its mouth. Uh, and don't get bitten, of course. But uh, see if you can peel back its lips and have a look at the molar teeth. Now those molar teeth in any of these predators, uh, like your dog or your cat, um, have, are called carnassials. And you can see that they're quite sharply ridged. They're like little knives. And what they do is, when they close over each other, you can now, if you've got a particularly compliant dog or cat, <laughs> open and shut its jaws and watch how the teeth at the back close over each other. And you'll find that unlike ours, they don't close on top. Let's just try there. You can see the big female is not running away. She's going to look what's happening. This is very interesting. has scarped. Gee whiz, Brian. Shall we... I don't want to move everybody. I don't want to give her a fight. I'm is raining on quarantine clearings. If the rain comes here, I'm afraid we have to run for home because we're on a vehicle with a lot of electricity on it and uh, Brian will basically be cooked like a boiled fish. Yeah. One, two, three. What is he running from? I wonder what he saw. So, 
There, look. Hyenas. In the background, you may just have spotted the um, the eyes in the background. I think those are hyenas. But you'll notice the females are completely relaxed. They're looking that way. Half of them are still asleep. But we had that very interesting question about why the Birmingham boys wouldn't necessarily attack the young males here. And the reason you've just seen, they're just, they're not, they're very nervous, they're very nervy, they're not going to display any kind of aggression or, ar or, or arrogance. Okay, everybody, I'm afraid that's it. It's starting to rain, we're going to have to make a run for it. Sorry about that. There really is naught we can do about it. Brian? James? We go for it. Let's go for it. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. We're, I'm going to sit here while Brian puts the rain cover on, and then, and then we're going to have to call it quits. I'm sorry about that. But the weather we can do not about. And yeah, it's it were it not for the fact that Louise and of course Eugene. Bye bye. We'll see you in the dawn. Hopefully, keep safe. And sorry it was late. Bye bye.